All right, this is fun. It's my pleasure to have us meet with Jason Middlebrook tonight. And um, how old are you, Jason? I'm 46. And have I known you, what, for over 40 years or something? Uh, at least. It depends on when my dad started sh showing with you. Was I a, was I a toddler? Was I a Oh, you were father? totally a toddler. Yeah. Um, but I can't, you know. It, yeah, it's just, that's pretty funny. So for me, this is really interesting because Jason's father, David Middlebrook, is an artist who I represented. And, um, you know, I've, been, I've paid attention, obviously, to his dad's career as, he, as it continues. You know, and Jason's become a star in his own right, and it's really interesting. So I don't know where we begin this discussion. How old were you when you left Michigan for California? Because I didn't know you until you got to California. Uh, well, there was a stop. Uh, you know, my dad got his graduate degree in Iowa. Right. And, and his first teaching job was Lexington, Kentucky. And so my brother was born in Lexington. And um, is Aaron older than you? Aaron's five years younger. Okay, right. All right. So, so, so I probably uh, didn't know you until you were probably eight or nine. Yeah, we arrived in California when I was in like the third grade, fourth grade. Okay. Yeah. So early 70s, and uh, that's when my dad probably started showing with you, like 72, 73, right? 74? 74, 75, probably. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Rock, I the have... Rock the camera back a little bit so that I can see your forehead, not just your nose. There you go. Okay. Um, so, what was it like? And your mom was really, is, was and is creative. What was it like growing in, up in that lunacy, in that, you know, in that household? Uh, it was pretty exciting, you know. Um, you know, I think it it, it helped uh, me kind of form my identity as, as an artist today because having two creative parents was uh, it kind of it kind of made you believe that you could do it, you know, that you could be you could be an artist. They were they were pretty outrageous parents. Unfortunately, their marriage didn't make it, but their careers did. Um, I think their marriage was. It was just there was too much personality for a marriage, you know. It was they both had a they both had a ton of person have a ton of personality. There's too much alike. That was the problem, you know. In in retrospect, so but growing up in that in that environment was really um it was supportive creatively to say the but, least. But so when did you figure out you wanted to be an artist? I think it wasn't until about 19 or 20, you know, as a kid, I drew and I was really creative and then I became kind of a jock in high school and I was kind of put off by art for a little while, but it wasn't until I took a painting class my first year in college that I got really turned on. Um, Where was that? It was actually in a little junior college in Santa Cruz called Cabrillo. I remember Cabrillo, yeah. Yeah. I ended up going to uh, UC Santa Cruz and then on to the Art Institute in San Francisco for my master's. But it was those first couple classes in, in junior college that got me really fired up. And then I and then it all made sense, you know. So right, but, but, then I, but your brother isn't, an, Aaron's not in the arts, right? No, he's a scientist. Yeah. And your sister? She's an actress, so she's closer to me creatively than Aaron, even though Aaron thinks like an artist, though. He makes furniture. He's kind of an artist trapped in a scientist's mind, really. My brother's pretty brilliant. Yeah, I remember that. I remember some of the ridiculous things you all said. Um, yeah. <laughs> you guys were great. All right, so how did you, what, what, how did you get your ass on the map? How did, how, you know, I mean, you, uh, wouldn't you say your career is going nicely? I'd say I, I'm very fortunate that I make a living from my art, and I feel like I'm fortunate that I, I came to New York at the right time and I worked really hard, and I got I made some good I, I built some good relationships that have, that have helped that have helped a All right, lot. So let's talk let's talk about the progress from the get go. So you so you got out as though. Was there was there any time between San Jose? Where, where did you get your undergraduate degree? I got my undergraduate Santa degree in Santa Cruz. I graduated in 1990. 
And then I moved, my wife and I, my girlfriend of now, and now my wife, we moved up to Oakland, and I, 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 uh, I got into graduate school at the Art Institute. So that's uh, 92, I get into graduate school. So, uh, but, all right, so wait, how much time is there between undergrad and graduate school? About a year and a half. Okay, uh, what did you do then? Were you making art? I painted houses, I made paintings, I got a studio in the East Bay, I lived up in Oakland. I rented a law from Be Bruce Beasley. Remember that that guy? He's still around. I do. Yeah, and I met Peter Gould, who actually used to show with you. I yeah, come on. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's way back. Yeah, he was living in West Oakland when I moved to West Oakland. We got to be friends. So there was a second Paul Klein connection, you know, when I was starting to go to graduate school. So then in '92, I get into graduate school. And then the day I graduate in 94, I had applied to the Whitney program in New York. And I um, we moved, I got in. I got into the Whitney program, the Whitney Independent Study Program in 1994. My wife and I, we moved to New York from August of 94. And so I kind of hit the ground in the mid-90s. Well, what, what did your work look like then compared to what it looks like now? You know, I was kind of invested in this kind of bad boy identity politics art. You know, I was making a lot of, you know, kind of Matthew Barney object oriented stuff. Drawing was always a part of my practice. It was sculptures of log cabins, sculptures of uh, testicles hanging from rear view mirrors of cars. It was it was kind of bad boy California car art, you know, and I think New York was invested in identity politics in the mid '90s, as was a lot of the art world. You know, there was there was kind of AIDS activism. There was all these different identity politics things, and I came to New York in the middle of that. You know, and um, so that's '94. We lived in East Village for a year, '95, '96. I was 28, 29. My goal is I wanted to have a one-person show in New York before I turned 30. I had studio visits, group show after group show, and I got a gallery, and I got, I made that goal. I had a one-person show in Manhattan before I turned 30. That was like my goal. I started working with one gallery, and I just built it from there. We had a loft in Brooklyn, and I just worked and worked and worked. Let's talk about the worked and worked and worked. What does that mean? What did you do? I think... Um, Coming what kind from, of things? What kind of things do you remember that you know that were good, good tactics? I think coming from the coming from San Francisco, in that kind of environment of a very process-oriented art world, being the Art Institute, this history of like Bay Area figurative painting, and arriving in Brooklyn and New York, and being in this kind of environment where artists were pushing themselves, everyone was really ambitious and motivated. I was ready to get out of San Francisco and I was ready to hit New York and just go for it. You know, really meet people, get in group shows, meet curators, work in my studio around the clock, you know. Okay. Do so what I could to make money, you know. Did and you do a straight so, job then? I uh, I started building, it was a really cool thing. I, I met some people at the new museum and I started building walls for museums. And I tried working for galleries, and that was a disaster. I, I, I would never recommend to work for a gallery. Sorry, Paul. It was, it's, it's really I don't bad. <laughs> it, a certain type of artist can only be an artist assistant or work for a gallery. It's very difficult. You're right. And, and I tried both, and I failed. And so I started doing carpentry, and I started doing painting, and I met some people in the museum system. and. I had this gig for like three years, four years, where I built all the new museum's walls for every one of their shows. And it kind of made me have a lot more free studio time and then build this relationship with the new museum where I could come in and make things for them and then go back to Brooklyn and spend a lot of time in my studio. And slowly, the sales started to come through the galleries that I was working with, and then I didn't have to work. It got to the point where the pendulum kind of, you know, flipped. But it took, it took from two, it took from 1994 to 2003, 2002, before I started to sell art and started to like sustain my living and and kind of make it a little bit. 2004, 2005, you know. 
What year were you born? You were born in 76? No, earlier. 66. And, all right, so so you had a group show before 96 in Manhattan or in New York? I had a solo show before 96 in New York. How many How many group shows do you think you had between 94 and 2002 or three? 10 or 15 a year. Like I was... I was I was showing anywhere, garages, basements, roofs, bathrooms. I mean, New York. You wouldn't, you wouldn't turn down an opportunity. Yeah, and, and then sometimes I kind of regret that. I look at, I used to know Wade Guyton, you know. Wade Guyton is a pretty hot artist right now. I used to see him in Waynesburg, and he was the king of saying no. He said no to everybody. He, didn't, he wasn't in a single show, and I was, I was like, I said yes to everybody. And I was like, how do you do it? He's like, I'm waiting. I'm just waiting. <laughs> and, and now look at his career. I mean, he, he, he was calculated strategically, you know, trying to place himself. And, uh, but I was the I, 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 would, I would take a wager on which of you is in the better place in 10 years. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, that's another conversation. There's artists right now that are really doing well, like, Better than they probably ever imagined, and and who knows what's going to happen to them, you know, you know it's there's probably a lot more money in the art world than even you or I ever could imagine, you know it's it's totally changed, which I think is good and bad, you know. Yeah, I agree. Um, so how, all right, how do these groups? I mean, so we're talking to a bunch of artists who want their careers to be in a better place. So, yeah, yeah. And, and you're talking about a lot of group exhibits, and so what was your experience with these? Sometimes nothing would come from them, and sometimes something would happen. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes, you know, you meet another artist. Artists were always kind of the link. Artists and curators would introduce you to other people, and that kind of, that kind of formed your community. And um, I think... Uh, I think the visibility of being in Brooklyn at that time, a lot of it was timing. Brooklyn was really exploding. It still is. Look at Bushwick. Bushwick is out of control. I mean, there's 15 bars that open this summer, 25 galleries that open in one year. I mean, New York has this way of like, it's like a virus. And, and I got into, I got in with some artists that I really respected and I, and, and met a few people and, a lot of it was just putting myself out there in that community and working really hard and wanting to be involved with, with the community. Um, and I think if you're an artist and you can, can kind of search out that, you need that little community. Even if you're slightly isolated, you need that little community. Because that, that led to a lot of really good things, knowing those people, you know. So you'd be, I mean, this is something I stress a lot in talking to these folks, but the notion of being mutually supportive and you share opportunities or an opportunity happens and somebody else says, this isn't for me, Jason, but you might want to look at it. Yeah, or, hey, let's organize this show on a boat. Let's find somebody who's got a boat. Like, interesting ideas that get some attention, you know. Let's, let's do a show on a roof. I got involved with this guy named Dave Muller. He's a pretty cool guy. He, he, he's a Los Angeles artist. But he had this awesome project called Three Day Weekend. For years, he did shows on a three day weekend that would have a holiday. And I did about 10 shows with him. It was like Veterans Day or Memorial Day. And they were just pop up shows. But they were incredibly successful because the attendance, it was only three days. So I did one in LA with him. I did a couple in New York. And they were real transient, real kind of interesting exciting shows my dad actually came to la and helped me on one it was really fun he did it in his studio he was working for mike kelly at the time and then he was doing these three-day weekends on on the weekends and um so there was always little things like that popping up like hey let's do this get involved with this this will be fun let's try this and um i think it helped build the foundation how do you? All right, I got that. How do you break? I, you know, I, I want to. I want to segue to the. I'm a dad. I have kids. I've got a wife. Um, I mean, I think it's frequently difficult for artists to be. Oh, are we, am I getting in delicate territory? A no, decent, no. a yeah. decent parent. Um, and 
the, you know, I mean, are you parenting your kids different than you were parented? Uh, yeah, I think, I think my environment is a lot less chaotic than the environment that I grew up in. Sometimes my brother says, how the hell did we make it? You know, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, I know, but my, my brothers and sisters say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, we have car seats now. You know, we have, huh? car seats. we have car seats, for example. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I'm at home a lot like my dad was. Um, my wife is a stay-at-home mom. She is an artist, but she's been able to be with the kids a lot more. So it feels a little more concentrated than my, my upbringing. And, um, I had kids later than my mom and dad. So How old are your children now? My kids are nine and three. See, so I was, artists have kids later now because it takes more time to get established. And so once you're established, I think parenting's a little bit easier now than it would have been if I was 23, like my mom was. My mom and dad were 22. So you kind of grow up with your parents and their craziness because they're trying to figure it out. They're kids, you know. Um, so being a parent now and an artist in my mid 40s is great because you're 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 more successful, you're more together, you know, you're you're more focused. I wouldn't have wanted to do it when I was in my 20s, you know. I was too anxious, way too anxious. Good for you. Um, you talked a moment ago about cooperating with other artists, growing friendships. I mean, and You've got uh, some of these artists are not as successful or acknowledged as you are. Are you guys still friends? Has 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 one person getting a and I'm hoping some of the others are, you know, close to you, above you, etc. What I'm getting at is how does somebody's getting acknowledgement affect your your relationships? Um, it's not. It's the ones that I'm friends with have the had enough self confidence to begin with and that have had their own success. Artists are extremely competitive, highly insecure, very sensitive. Um, I have a couple friends that I'm not as close with. A, they didn't have kids and I might be more successful, but I also left Brooklyn. You know, I, I went to the country. And so I've made new friendships with parents that are kind of creative, but less artists. Um, the friendships that I have that I'm really close to of artists that I've known for 20 years, they are successful artists. Uh, that's not to say I have friends that aren't successful artists, but it just so happens that you see them more, you're in more circles, and it, you have more in common. You know, they're showing, they're out there, they're being collected, they're, in, they're going to big shows, they're kind of, you know, on the same trajectory. Did, what did I say? Um, how difficult was it getting a mortgage? Uh, up here, it wasn't so bad because outside of New York, when you get out in the country, it's pretty depressed. Upstate New York is pretty depressed. So we were trying to actually buy something in Brooklyn, but I just couldn't afford it. You know, I, I wasn't there yet. I had Violet in 2003. We bought the house in 2001, but we didn't move up here until about 2006. So I didn't have the kind of money that I needed to buy something in Brooklyn. And so we had to save some money, and they were, in 2002, 2003, they wanted to lend money, you know. Right. It was right. way before 2008 or any of that. So that, that, wasn't, that wasn't too hard. You know, it's it's a depressed. Well, where I was trying to go with that conversation, and I'm still, you know, curious about this, is, I mean, you know, I'm sort of jealous sometimes of people who have a, a, a salary, and you know, they get they they get to plot, you know, and they, you know, there's not going to be any big windfalls, but there's, you know, but they're not going to have any big shortfalls. And as a and as a visual artist, you know, it's sometimes hard to know when your next decent payday is going to come. And, you know, how I guess it's not that different than being a Hollywood actor or actress, you know. I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, Angelica Houston because um, um, Robert Graham, you know, who was a wonderful artist, they were married, he died, um, you know, and she was having difficulty getting work because she was so well-known that people didn't, you know what I mean? 
Yeah. And, and and she couldn't afford to pay for Bob's studio after he died and was having all kinds of problems. You know, yeah, now yeah. she's gotten a nice, you know, starring role in the TV series. But um, so how is it for you trying to, you know, plot, anticipate, you know, yearly expenses? Uh, um, you know, it's scary because I always had this message from my father that I should get a tenure track job, you know, that I should teach because he had such a good run teaching and in his generation it was easier to get a job and every artist got a job you know or they tried to get a, a tenure track job and i bounced around and teach i've taught a little bit but i but i didn't want to teach full time i i always thought it was the kiss of death of your art career i kind of you think know? so too i mean i know an artist who said i'm willing to teach for two years and if I teach for more than two years, then I'm a teacher first and an artist second, and I want to be an artist first. Yeah. There's only one teacher I've ever met that could pull it off, and my dad's a close second, but John Baldessari taught his whole career, and his best friends were his students. And he's the, he's a perfect model of somebody who had a really nice relationship with his students, yet became an international art, art, art star. Like, he really is an important artist for, like, L.A. conceptualism. But, um, you know, I've had some good years, and you just kind of pack it away. Um, you know, um, I'm trying to do some investments. You know, there's no there's no guarantees. You know, you have months where you don't sell a piece, and then you sell two or three, or you get a commission. And, you know, you just get, you get conditioned to live with less, just all the way back to art school. You know, you, you're used to living with nothing. So if you make, you know, 20 grand one month, you're like, whoa, you know, it's all relative, you know? Yep. The problem is if you make it a lot and then you start spending it and then you don't sell any art, that's where you can get in trouble. You just always have to remind yourself that it's a gift to sell art. You know, it's a, it's a treat. And, um, it, you know, you just, you just, I just think I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of it because I've seen so many artists be so high and then crash and then have bad years and bad months and then great years and it it can drive you crazy. It can really drive you crazy, the money part of it. It's it it, it can kill your studio work, you know, if you think about it too much. Has that been an issue for you? That the the roller coaster or have you done pretty well at leveling it out? I've done pretty well I think at leveling it out and, and my wife and I have been really frugal about managing our expenses and our and our risk that we take on. Um, you know, the good thing about being 46 is that my prices are higher now. The more work you sell, the more you can charge. It's a basic lesson in economics. You know that from being an art dealer. You got an artist that only sold three pieces, you can't charge that much. You sold 600 pieces, you can charge a lot more. So I think the idea of consistency and a routine and, and um, being prolific helps a lot, you know, making a lot of work. I, I believe strongly in failure, failures in the studio. Like you have to fail to make a good piece. And I may, I have three storage units full of art, <laughs> you know, so you don't sell it all and you have to make mistakes to make good art. You have to. Um, How often does stuff come out of those storage units? Auctions, gifts. Wait, wait, when you say auctions, you mean benefit auctions. Benefit auctions, yeah. Gifts. Uh, Recycling pieces, a lot of it's stuff I'm just afraid to address and open. I got one storage unit I haven't opened in two years. It's all sculpture, you know. I just it's just a deduction as far as I see it. <laughs> I don't know what to do with it. Someone needs to make write a book about artist storage. It's it's a yeah. Common. You know you're probably right. I, maybe I'll think about it, but I don't want to write it. <laughs> um, so. How, how many galleries are you working with? Uh, I work with Dodge Gallery in New York. I work with a Swedish gallery, Charlotte Lund, in Stockholm. And then I work with Monique in Chicago, uh, Monique Malesh. And uh, that's, I was working with one in Miami, but he closed. But I think three, three is enough. Three is enough. And New York is still just, you know, the others just can't compare. Chicago and Stockholm, they just, it's, you know, New York's still the hub, you know. And uh, I know artists that have five galleries, eight, it's too much. I, your quality goes down, it's too much. 
you know. Are you making mostly life size and larger pieces? Right now I'm making, uh, I just finished a body of work for Miami Art Fair that ships tomorrow. And those are all leaning sculptures, leaning wall, kind of these plank series I've been doing. Time out, they're done? You not. You don't have to go work on them tonight? No, no, she, my dealer was here overnight. She spent the night last night. We had breakfast. She picked the ones for Miami, so the truck's picking them up. I'm thrilled. I worked really hard on those. And um, There's a difference. That's the difference between you and your dad. <laughs> your dad your dad was the first artist I ever had where we had an opening and the artist was still at work. <laughs> well, he's pretty compulsive, you know. He'll, he'll be dead and he'll still be working in his, in his car. I know. I got comfortable with the notion of David after a bit. You know, I thought, well, this is cool. It's like, you know, a three-ring circus. This is okay. Yeah. You know, it never bothered me after the first time. Um, all right. Uh, so, so have, I'm, I'm doing some commissions. Those have been nice. I'm doing commissions for private collectors right now. One in uh, Santa Fe, Mickey and Jeannie Klein. And Don't know them. And then, uh, a guy in Columbus, Ron Pizzuti. So I, I get these collectors that want me to propose things for their property or for their house. And that can be a success or a failure. That, that's tricky. That's very tricky. Well, let's say it's a failure. The client is still on the hook or what happens? You know, many people want to just go into a gallery and buy something that's finished. And when you go down that road where you're going to make something site specific for someone and you're going to work with them, that can be really, it can be challenging. You know, they have to be happy. They have to take a certain amount of leap of faith in what they see on paper and what they get in reality, you know, and they have to give you some leeway. So that can be a little, that can be a little slippery, but um, I really love going to someone's property and responding to the site. Um, the, the piece in Santa Fe, there's five Andy Goldsworthy's, and I'm going to have two pieces there. So it was really wonderful to, like, spend time on this property, and, and they, they gave me a year to come up with an idea. So it's kind of like they want you to take your time, propose something, discuss it, come back, go there, come back. Like, they're really into the whole process. And that's, like, we, an ideal client. We rescheduled this discussion because you had to go to where? Thailand? Yeah, for their piece. I'm making them uh, a huge pine cone, a huge pine cone, like a pine cone the size of a car. Okay. And so the, the foundries, I, were, I was getting quotes in America for, like, unbelievably high prices, like, you know, Talex and, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And I've got this Swedish friend that works with a foundry in Thailand, and the, the Thai... They're all Buddhists. They're all from Burma, and their level of craftsmanship is off the hook. Just unbelievable craftsmanship, and the price is half the price. It's just the other side of the world. So Yeah. And I'd never been to the East, and I was like, all right, I'll go check it out. So uh, I'm going back in mid-December for phase two of the pine cone. Where, uh, they're, they've got a – what they did is they scanned a little pine cone, and we're making it, you know, we're blowing it up, just like in Hollywood. So yep. each leaf has to be blown up, and then I have to approve the model in Thailand. And then it'll be shipped to Santa Fe. It's going to be, a, it's a fun project. It'll be bronze? Bronze, yeah. And what's, totally. the, what's the, Yeah. What are they casting it from? What are they making it out of? Uh, they're making it from a real pine cone, and then it's all rubber molds from waxes of the real pine cone blown up. It's 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 a lot different from my dad. You know, he would have to cut it in half and then put it on its axis and you know spin it around. And I just like the idea that it's enlarged. You know, it's just a really simple kind of. You you will discover this pine cone when you're on a hike on their property. So it'll be like coming across. You know, something. Oh my God! Yeah. Yeah. So they're really excited about it. Yeah. Very cool. Um, how do you feel like doing commissions takes you out of circulation? Uh, yes and I mean, no. I mean, you know, like your dad, your dad, your dad. I, you know, your dad. He he went from being. I mean, these are crass terms, sort of. But he went from being a gallery artist to someone who made almost solely commissions, right? Yeah, I think it I think it hurt him in a little bit of a way, but um, I mean in terms know, of reputation and people being you know and growing your career 
in terms of knowledge, notoriety, acknowledgement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got a girl. He's got a woman right now in San Francisco, and things are really going great for him. He did. He was just in an art fair and sold everything in Europe. Like he's he's having a real revival, but it took a gallery to take an interest to get him back on the uh, map. And I think it's a real lesson. You got to always keep one foot somehow in the art world, as much as you might detest the art world and, and not like it. You got to keep. Yep. You got to keep a foot in there. These commissions don't stop me from doing art fairs and. You know, and if anything, they kind of <laughs> give me a little bit of more financial freedom to take a little bit more risk for like white cube kind of shows. Um, almost like a gallery does a fair. If a gallery sells out a fair, they can show a performance show the next couple, you know, cycles. Where before they might have to have a painting show over and over just to pay the rent, you know. So the commissions give me, um, plus these people that are giving me, doing the commissions with they have gallery they have museum tours on their property like you, you the visibility is much different than being stuck somewhere up on the hill you know yeah. you know so um I, I all the things i've learned a lot from my dad i've learned what to do and what not to do i've tried you know he's been a really good soundboard on that level do you give him credit ever that he knows of you know what I give him credit for is um no to him. <laughs> oh, to, he's the most passionate artist I've ever met. I have to say that. Like he loves making art, like to his core. And it's true. All the rest is kind of bullshit at the end of the day. You know, like selling it, showing it. It's all kind of secondary. You know, and so that part of him I really really respect. The other the other stuff uh uh, I tried to model my career a little differently. Let's put it that way. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. I'm, is the issue for, in, is there ever an issue for you in and or in your art about the segue, the transition between craft and fine art? Because your art has a high level of craft, you know, hand execution to it. Is that ever an issue? Yeah, I think it comes down to fashion. Um, I'm not really a cool artist, you know. Parentheses. Uh, yeah. I'm definitely a I'm definitely a handmade artist, and you know I think sometimes I've been in big kind of shows that straddle that line between craft and high art, and because I've done a lot of mosaicing, I've done some commissions that have mosaic tile and more functional stuff like benches and. Uh, I'm okay with that. You know, Jorge Pardo is somebody that straddled that line his whole career, and he's been pretty successful at it. Um, I think there's room for functionality in in high art, and there's room for um, kind of tactile materials. You know, it doesn't always have to be so slick and sterile. But I think I got some of that stuff from my dad. I like to make stuff that's really pretty to look at. You know, and sometimes cool high art isn't so pretty to look at. You know, no, it can be pretty dumb sometimes. And yeah. you know, and there's a movement to foot. I mean, a friend of mine calls it feebleism, or just you know, <laughs> poorly executed art by intent. That that should annoys me. You're not you're not guilty of that. Well, that stuff is also you can blame that on graduate schools a little bit. There was a whole yes, group indeed. of artists that wanted to be like folk artists, but they had three MFAs. You know. You know, I think there's a dumbing down that they're trying to play with, and and I respect that. But I like to make I like to make things that are fun to look at. I like I enjoy the craft of making making beautiful things. Um, and yeah, that keeps me out of some shows. And curators don't like my work, and maybe it's not political enough or edgy enough, but. Um, I, I don't really care. I I, I like the result. I, I like it more than I used to. I used to be much more critical of it. I like it more more lately. How is it? You're two hours out of New York City. Do, how many? I mean, if when somebody wants to do a studio visit, they got to be pretty committed. Or they yeah. don't come. Curators, what's the deal? It's an all day event. You either take a train from Penn Station, and it's two hours door to door, or you drive and you spend the night. 
but but I kind of I think I left New York at the right time, and I said if they're committed, they're going to come. You know, it's kind of if you build it, they will come. And I've probably missed out on some opportunities, but I've had I've had some good people show up here and spend the day with me and walk my land and really spend some time in my studio. You, prob you probably know that they're in. I mean, you know, it's like when I had a gallery that was in a building with a lot of other galleries. I never knew if somebody walked in, was interested, going to be interested or not. So frequently I didn't get up and, you know, treat them as politely as I would when I had a, when, when I became a destination. And you're definitely yeah. a destination. And if somebody shows up, you know, you probably go out of your way much more than the people in Brooklyn go out of their way for somebody. Yeah, and and Hudson has also gotten really arty. Like there's a there's a the Nada Art Fair has done two years in a row here. Richard Artswagger lives down the street. Terry Winters lives a mile away. Like it's kind of become like the poor man's Hamptons, and artists are just they're leaving New York a lot more often than you realize. They're they're down there less and less and. I see artists at the hardware store all the time that are really international artists. So I don't feel as isolated as I did when I first moved up here. I feel like there's a community always brewing up here because New York changed a lot. It, it became a shopping mall on many levels. And unless you've got five million bucks to buy a building, you can't have a great studio in New York. Unless you started in the 70s and you got like, you know, rent controlled loft in Soho or something. So, uh, so you're making these large scale wood pieces, et cetera, mostly in your studio that's on your property there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How big is your studio? It's about 1,200 square feet and it's, it's just 50 feet from my kitchen. And it's got 20 foot ceilings though. I built, I built an addition that's got really high ceilings with a big door so I can make big work. And, um, I'm finding this wood at these mills in, in Western Massachusetts, which is only about 30 minutes from here. So there's some great wood that I've really gotten into up here since I moved up here. And um, Have you ever bought a barn and knocked it down for the wood? No, but I I just bought, we just bought a little house. Like a, uh, if you come visit me, you'll have your own little art pad down the street. So I'm putting old barn board, I'm putting old wood in the floor of that house. Yeah, work That's on cool. Yeah. How much of your work sells at art fairs as opposed to galleries as opposed to some other way? Uh, when I do art fairs, the good ones, it can be they can be really lucrative and usually I sell pretty much everything that's at the art fair, but I'd say gallery shows these last um, four or five solos in New York, I've almost sold everything. Things have been pretty good. You know, I do a lot of drawings, and those are priced a little less. Um, I was with one woman for 10 years. She closed, now I'm with another gallery. And so, you know, uh, we've been pretty strategic about not showing too much, not showing too often, you know. And uh, Who's showing your work in Miami? I was with Kevin Brook for a while. No, 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 at the art fair coming up. Oh, uh, Dodge, my gallery in New York. And which fair is this? It's called Untitled. It's a new fair. It's right on the beach. So I think, you know, these things pop up every couple of years. There's some anticipation. There's some Chicago galleries in it. it should, yeah, I noticed it should, that. It should be pretty fun. Yeah. Are you going to the fair? Yeah, my yeah. wife and I are going to go. It'll I'll see you fair. there. Yeah, I'll are find you going to do that? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, 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 but are you going to work the booth? Are you going to sit there and shield your stuff? Have uh, you done I, that? I won't sit there. I might. I might you know, stumble in from time to time. But we should go look at art. My dad's going to be there. We should go oh, look wow. at art. Yeah, oh, he's got, yeah, he's got work in another fair. Yeah. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, so he All right, cool. Hey, how about you guys? Somebody out here, you have any questions for Jason? I mean, just because we go, you can participate in this family love fest. It's fine. Child, <laughs> go ahead. Hi, Jason. Yes, you'll see. <laughs> Um, in those days when you were showing, like, Raina, like Chala, Chala, for, for some reason you're quite loud. I'm sorry. Um, in those days when you were showing everywhere, uh, it's easy to kind of get to where you're spinning your wheels. And I'm wondering if you got any insights in retrospect of, of what kind of uh, exhibition opportunities were uh, non 
fruitful or a waste of time or would you regret entirely or even even led to to negative things maybe um i i, I regret the one where um I felt maybe I might have been taken advantage of or things weren't handled in a professional manner. Work wasn't insured or somebody broke something and, and, and or somebody, you know, you regret the ones, you have to have intuition where, well, this doesn't sound very good. They're not treating the artist with respect or they're expecting us to do all the work because they they think we should be lucky to be showing with them or in this context. And so I regret, maybe putting myself in compromised positions, you know, like there was a couple shows in Europe and I I wasn't sure if I was going to get paid and et cetera, et cetera, that kind of stuff. So you just kind of have to have intuition and be like, okay, this sounds like a good thing and there's some money for the artist and they are treating the art with, with respect. Um, you know, there's a couple red flags. If there's no budget and they want you to shift the work or something, or if, there's uh, just, you know, things that, that aren't sitting well, but you really want to show with your friend or you really want to be in this show. You just you kind of have to have a, you know, a governor in, in yourself that says, this, this, this sounds like I might be getting taken advantage of or this show sounds really shitty. There's too many artists and they're bad artists or, you know, it's only open for two hours. Like, what's going on? Like, stuff like that, you know. Charlotte, you doing a follow on with that? That's helpful. Thank you, Jason. Cool. Thank you, cool. too, Charlotte. Um, Mika, I saw you next. Go ahead, Mika. Uh, Jason, so you have your three galleries that you like, and um, what is the rule of thumb for artists? Like, how, how many miles apart do galleries need to be before toes get stepped on? And who, uh, like, let's say then you have three galleries. How do you choose uh, what uh, art pieces go to which ones and do they fight over them or do you choose? Do they choose? How do you do Yeah, um, It's kind of complicated because sometimes your primary gallery wants 10% of those other, of your sales from the other galleries. Uh, that was really um, common when I first started showing in New York. My primary gallery in New York wanted a piece of every show I was in with every other, you know, every solo show that I was in. And some galleries, especially galleries in Europe, they don't want to do that. They, 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 they want their 50% and you get your 50%. So there was some weird negotiations with that. Um, ideally, you have a show every 18 months, a solo show, 18 to 24 months. So if you've got three galleries, you just have to stagger it. And sometimes you might show a piece that didn't sell in one gallery and, and it might make sense to show it again like in europe or, or in chicago for example but ideally those galleries are going to want all brand new work and they're going to want that work exclusively from the other galleries so you just have to kind of negotiate that and be like okay i finished that body of work for new york now i'm working on this show for this gallery it's a smaller gallery so i don't have to make as much work you know that kind of thing um some dealers are super controlling and they, they want to dictate the game and then other dealers are like, oh, go show anywhere you want. It's fine by me. It doesn't matter. You know, so you just kind of negotiate that stuff, you know, uh, before beforehand. Anything more, Mika? Um, well, then how many miles apart, let's say you're in New York and you have um, – you know, I mean, physically, how many miles apart do galleries have to be, or do they They don't even care? Uh, well, I have friends that show in New York and Philadelphia and Boston, you know. Uh, those are four hours, <laughs> hour and a half. Um, so I don't think there's any rules. To, I, I think, you know, if you had a gallery in Chicago and you, had, you could have one in Detroit, you could have one in Milwaukee. I mean, you know, I, I think... I think there's no kind of rules to distance. I know you can't have two in Chicago. That might be kind of tricky. Although a lot of people now are collaborating with someone else and then they have another gallery. Like there's all these new forms of representation. And so some people might have three galleries in Chicago, but it, under different names or under different bodies of work. Um, I don't think there's any rules about distance. I don't think there's any kind of formula there. 
You know, if somebody likes your work and they understand your work, you should show with them. If they get it and, and you trust them, you should show with them whether they're in your garage or like, you know, in Japan, you know. <laughs> if they get it and they really believe in you, then you should you should work with them and you trust them. Um, thank you. And let's talk, you, you did this huge hanging commission in Chicago for the Museum of Contemporary Art. Who owns that piece now? Unfortunately, no one owns it. Um, uh, DePaul University, I tried to gift it to DePaul, and they almost took it. But uh, the MCA was going to buy it, and then they weren't going to buy it, and they were going to buy it. And it was a difficult piece to uh, keep with them because it had a, it cost a lot to install. Right. It has to be rigged, you know. I mean, this piece was hanging, let's describe it. It was hanging from the ceiling made out of scrap timber and other wooden artifacts, and it probably weighed as much as a car. It weighed 4,000 pounds. Yeah. yeah. One side of it was a 2,000-pound maple log that I got from a mill in Michigan, and the other side of it was debris that I scavenged from the streets of Chicago. So it balanced itself out. Thank you for cleaning up our city. Yeah. Your city is so clean. Oh, my God. I, I couldn't find stuff. It took me a month to find enough stuff. I'm telling you. I couldn't believe it. It's not like New York. New York's filthy compared to Chicago. That's what people hear. That's what we hear, but that's not what we believe. Yeah. Um, okay. So, but so, but you got paid for it as if you had sold it, didn't you? For, well, or not? no. They they paid. They 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 paid for everything. They they paid to make the piece. I I went to Chicago at least a dozen times. They paid all my expenses, and then they in the end they bought a drawing. So it was a really great experience. It was you know it was great exposure. And then the show traveled for two years, but that piece didn't travel. That was specifically made for the MCA. Right. I hung in the so it was a win-win. It was a win-win. I I really wanted them to buy the piece because I thought the piece was perfect for that space, but in the end they didn't, but it was a great opportunity. I feel fortunate to have the opportunity. How much difference is having that major piece hanging in a significant museum exhibit? I always call that show Calder and the Kids. <laughs> what, was, what, was, what was the show? It was Calder was on one side of the museum, yeah, and then was, uh, you guys... I got the catalog right here. It was like it had some kind of academic title like Calder and his influences, or yeah, that's probably it. So, all right. So, what did that what did that exposure do for you? Did it elevate your game, or did it get you more attention? Um, quantifiably, it, it gave me a lot of self confidence to have a, a show that went from the MCA to the National in Dallas to the Orange County Museum to the and then it ended at the Museum in Duke, and uh, it kind of you know, it felt re I felt really proud to be affiliated with those artists and that artist. Calder's a magnificent artist. He's, I, I think he's, he's truly a great artist. And so uh, it gave me some self-confidence. It gave, it gave me a nice kind of museum experience. And um, it gave me a lot of visibility. A lot of people saw that show. And uh, Did your prices go up because of it? Uh... I don't think maybe indirectly, you know. I think that sh sure a museum show is going to help your prices, but it wasn't like not like Rashid's prices. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Rashid just came up to visit me a couple weeks ago, and uh, that's a different league. <laughs> is he humble now? Uh, oh, he's pretty humble, but he's a rock star. He's like Chicago between him and. Nick Cave and Theaster Gates, they're like the Chicago bad boys right now. They're doing pretty uh, well. Yeah, he's a, yeah, he just bought a Ferrari. I, I won't say any more. Oh, Rashid. Okay. Yeah. Rashid. yeah. <laughs> but All right. no, uh, the MCA was, it was great. Great. Really great experience. Lynn Warren. Lynn Warren's fabulous. She is indeed. Rita, you, go ahead. Thanks. Um, thanks for speaking with us, Jason. I've really enjoyed hearing you speak about um, not just your art, but your family life as well. I'm in a similar age group and similar situation. Um, I'm wondering, and um, I'm actually really familiar with that part of New York, too. I have family in that area. So um, 
Well, my question for you is, are you finding, since you have such a broad reach with your art right now, are you finding that some art markets in general are more open, more loose, um, for example, uh, just more open to experimental art, to things that are maybe less easily categorized, or is that just too big of a question to do a statement? When you say art markets, do you mean are people buying video? Are people interested in more work that isn't traditional, like painting, drawing, and sculpture? Are you saying like? I'm, I'm thinking more about installation work and maybe large-scale sculpture that doesn't readily fit into like a, a home collection. You know, a lot of people have been talking about the European market being more. The last speaker that we had tonight, um, you know, he specifically seems to be doing very well in Europe, and he has a very specific kind of art that he's working with. But I'm just wondering what you're finding with your work, if there's anything. I think I think so. I think people. Um, I think 2008 did a lot of weird things. The, the art market, the commercial kind of gallery market, really crashed. You know, it really went through this huge as as did the economy. And I started to find collectors reaching out to artists, and 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 dealers were kind of like, hey, what's going on? And 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 collectors wanted more of a personal relationship with artists and they wanted to kind of get to know artists and say, I mean, they've always done this historically, but I, I find it more and more where they wanted to have you respond to their space or just more more intimacy, you know, more kind of like, well, what do you think about this? We got this other thing, you want to do this? And 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 I, I, found, I found that there's the gallery world there's the museum world. There's all these different worlds, and they all overlap. But as your career goes, sometimes you kind of gravitate towards one and keep one foot in another, and you know they kind of mold together. I just to answer your question, I think things have gotten a lot more personal. They've gotten more intimate. Even though Larry Gagosian selling stuff via his iPhone, you know, for millions of dollars, that that world's always going to be there. Um, but the people that are really thoughtful, the more European model, those people like they buy you in depth and they're supportive and they're interested and they're engaged. You know, they're not just like buying stuff from an iPhone at a dinner party, you know. They're yeah. they're they're invested. You know. And so when it comes to in, you know, selling installations, that's neither here nor there. If they like it, they're the one percent. They got the money, they're gonna buy it. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Okay. Um, <clears throat> some of the stuff you make has a genuine cost of materials to it, right? Does this does this typically come off the top before proceeds are split? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, on on I tried to really do the kind of sustainable route for a long time. I was making real recycled art, but. Um, for example, if you're going to make a bronze pine cone, it just costs money to deal with snow and wind and rain. You, you just have to spend money to kind of make art. And uh, those costs have really gone up. Those costs are really high. And so, you know, if the client wants this kind of permanency and this kind of historical permanent piece, that, that usually comes off the top. You explain the, the like, I have a fee and... The gallery might have a fee, and then there's the cost to produce the piece, you know. And it's different for every client and every piece, but um, you kind of put it out there first and foremost, and, it, you know, it, we work it out. Cool. Laura, go ahead. Hey, uh, thanks for speaking with us. I have um, two sort of two questions. Um, the first one um you can just sort of briefly answer um, in terms of the commissions. Like, how how did that sort of come about? Was it that you, when you were working with your gallery, you're like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm open to commissions, or was it sort of just something that happened along the way, you know, that kind of thing? And then um, I have one other question. Um, so that's why I let him answer this one, and you can answer it. Then we'll go. We'll, yeah. Um, you know, every every. Uh, Every situation is slightly different. Sometimes they contact the gallery and they want something to be more site specific. Other times uh, I do a show somewhere and they come directly to me. And um, 
they want somebody wants you to either respond to a space or respond to an idea. Um, there's really no kind of like formula to that. It just it seems like it's just kind of as nebulous. It just evolves somehow. Um, every time I do a show, I I try. My goal is that the the work will somehow give me opportunities that are out of the kind of normal, you know, range and. Uh, that's always a goal for me because I, I get bored of making gallery art. It, it's too hard to make just white wall art. So um, these things just kind of evolve because I put it out there and then people also um, site specific work is just really, really popular. People, you know, from, from sculpture parks to uh, backyards to museum courtyards, it's very popular. Do you think you had to get a certain certain level of acclaim before site specific work became so people became so interested in you? I think you have to know. I think I think you have to make objects, and those objects have to be somewhat circulated or out there or somewhere where you can see them. Um, I just did a subway commission for the MTA in Brooklyn. I worked on that for three years, and. Uh, you know, it's it's nice to have something permanent out there as a reference point to show people. Um, but I don't know. It's like what came first, the chicken or the egg? I think you have to show works in some capacity <coughs> to have opportunities. You know, yeah, you have to. I think you're right. Okay, cool. Laura, did you have another question? Uh, yeah. Uh, so the way that you described your work when you first moved to New York after you got out of uh, graduate school, it sounds like it's changed quite a bit. Um, how, how did that sort of evolve for you? Was it just really like slowly or was there just like a moment? Like when was the point where you're like, this is this is it? Or has it always felt like whatever you've been making is totally great and you're really into it? Or do you ever feel like it was not quite to the point where you wanted it to be and then at some point it was there? I think what happened was um, I got I got a little self-conscious making art about me. I have I have a problem with art about people, you know, like specific autobiographical art. I think sometimes can be kind of didactic and a little too self-referential. And I, I, I'm not so interested in individuals. I'm more interested in kind of problems that we're facing as as a society or as the world. And so I think when my themes got a little more universal, kind of man versus nature or man versus debris or urban versus rural, I think things expanded for me. When you start to like address more universal themes, your audience gets bigger. Um, and when you stop trying to be so clever, your audience gets bigger because your audience is always smarter than you are. I always I, I I always distrust like 25 year old conceptual artists because <laughs> they just haven't lived long enough. So uh, you know when I when I kind of took myself out of the of the of the kind of identity of the work and started kind of looking at broader terms, I had I started to get more success in terms of the way in which my work could be interpreted. And I think that that's a really important thing. An artist once told me, you just keep going back to the same theme. And that theme had to evolve for me. I was kind of a late bloomer. And when I moved to New York, I was 28. I'm now 46. I think the last 10 years, the work has been much more, since like 35, 36, the work has gotten more universal and, and less about, you know, identity, but more about like kind of, Global identity in a way, this this kind of nature versus human kind of conflict, and um, you know it's a good challenge to make work that's not about you. You know, Alan Capro said there's two types of work: there's art about art, and there's art about life. And that's that's like the most profound thing I think you can take from like a teacher. Like Alan Capro was really intelligent man, and the. And art kind of is summed up into those two categories, you know, art about art and art about life. And so um, I did make a lot of art about art. Every artist does that. 
Every artist makes a piece about Warhol. Every artist makes a piece about Michelangelo or Giorgio Keith, you know. So um, that can also be a dangerous crutch too, you know. That that can that can limit your audience as well, just to the art world, and, and sometimes that can be dangerous. Does that kind of help a little bit, or kind of yeah, yeah. I, I think um, I that's that's great. Yeah, I, I really like to just sort of hear what um, uh, how different artists sort of evolve through time, and um, I think what you said makes a lot of sense for you and where you're at, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense. It's good advice. I, I think it's good, and I I don't think I've looked at my own work in that from that perspective. So I think that's um, interesting, and I'll have to think about it. Yeah, meaty stuff. Way to go! All right, Nika. Uh, Jason, um, Southern California and Northern California are such different worlds. Did you find a weird competition between those arts artists, or nothing at all? You know, I grew up in northern. I grew up in northern California, so that 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 environment is kind of entrenched in my like surfer hippie West Coast identity. You know, but northern California doesn't have an art world. It has Silicon Valley and good food and great weather. Southern California has an art world. It has a great art world. It has the thriving art community. And so I didn't start showing in Southern California until I moved to New York. And then everybody in New York thought I was from L.A., and everybody in L.A. thought I lived in California. And to this day, people still think that I'm an L.A. artist. I've never even lived in Los Angeles, and I've only shown there. It, it's kind of funny. So uh, I fit right into L.A. I, I liked it. I didn't go to graduate school in L.A., and I always felt if you went to graduate school in L.A., you should stay in L.A. Because the artists that are successful in Los Angeles went to graduate school in Los Angeles. It has a great art school system. And I went to graduate school in San Francisco, and then I moved to New York, and then I started showing in L.A. So, uh, you know, it was it was this kind of it was this kind of duality. New York, L.A., and San Francisco will never understand each other, and they'll always be at war. It's just an entirely different sensibility. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's, I'm really glad I grew up in, in San Francisco and not L.A., but I have no interest in showing in San Francisco. I tried, and it was not a success. San Francisco is a really difficult town to be an artist in. L.A. is a much better town to be an artist, much better. Thanks. Cool. Um, I'm coming your way, Dimitri. Hold on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jason. I'm a great fan of yours. I, I absolutely adored that sculpture that was hanging at MCA. I went there several times. Um, I have many questions, but uh, <laughs> I'll try to stick to the career one. Um, okay. I looked at your website, and um, what's the role of, of your personal website, and what is the what is your presence on the Internet? There's no blog attached to your a website, there isn't much verbiage. Uh, what do you think of the uh, cyber presence? Uh, I think I think a website is uh, important. I used to not think it was important. I used to think it was, you know, a waste of time. But uh, I, I don't put a lot of emphasis on it. I think that it, it helps some artists. It helps other artists. It's a really good kind of like meeting place. Um, I get a lot of people that contact me through my website that don't know anything about my work. It might, have an exchange. It might lead to a show. It might lead to a sale. Um, I wish that I had the time to actually make a much better website, but as of now, um, it's sufficient. It could always be better. It could be more current. It could be more interactive. Um, Eventually, I should probably trade some art with a web designer and do it right, you know, and really and really invest some time and money into it. Um, but then again, I also feel slightly ambivalent about it too, where I'm not sure what it really means, you know. Um, my gallery's website is pretty up to speed, and they have a pretty good 
archive of my reviews, my current images. So if somebody really wants to find out some more stuff, they can go to that website. Um, Facebook, it's okay. It's more or less a waste of time. But um, Facebook is good to see what other people are looking at, shows, art, ideas. That's kind of fun. Um, I often don't get to look at a lot of shows, so my friends will be in Chelsea or will be in other parts of the world, and they'll send me images of shows they're looking at. And that part's really nice, that you get to be somewhere else. Um, but the website thing, it's, it's kind of, it's there, and I should probably have a better one, but it's just on the list of things to do. How long ago, <clears throat> how often do you trade art for something? Uh, you know, for a while I was betting art, and I kind of got out of that habit. <laughs> I was betting on sports with collectors. And if I won, I got money, and if they won, uh, they got art. And then my dealer got pissed. Because she wanted to sell a piece, and I had to tell her I gave, I sent it to someone because I owed them for a bet. <laughs> and so uh, I don't trade as much, but I have bet a couple pieces over the years. <laughs> Funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. It works well or not. I'm not sure. Yeah, that, that's not necessarily uh, suggested, but uh, it is fun to, you know, play around your collectors. I've got a couple of collectors that are big sports fans. One of them is the eye doctor for the Orlando Magic. So whenever the Celtics are playing the Magic, we make a little bet, you know. So a little a little drawing for 500 bucks or something like that, you know. That's kind of cute. Yeah. Dimitri, you want to ask one more? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I wonder, um, let's see, um, your art uh, seems um, to be quite different. It varies from uh, can you hear me? There's a cleaning person here. We can hear you okay. Oh, okay. Um, some some of your pieces are extremely precise and just high-level craftsmanship. Some are, especially uh, site-specific installations, are really messy. Uh, do people expect certain things from you, and um, does this affect your career? And then another question. In 2008, there was a lot of beautiful acrylic paintings and drawings. And um, when you experiment, uh, is it a risk when you deviate, so to speak, from what people expect from you? Thank you. Uh, yeah, there, there, there's, a, there's a risk, but then again, that, that goes back to what we were talking about with those different contexts, uh, like the, the context of the MCA and, and that Calder show is, is a different context than a gallery show, and the context for like this project at Art House is entirely different from the MCA thing. And I, I think an artist has to wear many hats. And you can go to one exhibition and, and respond to the space differently than you would for a gallery show or vice versa. Um, I'm not one of those artists that makes the same type of work every time. And that can maybe hurt me and help me sometimes because it keeps me interested and invested. But um, I think that gap is narrowing with each year. Um, and if you look at my website or if you see my work, there tends to be threads throughout it. And uh, a lot of it's just solving, problem solving. You know, it's like you, you're given a problem and you have to come up with a solution. And uh, some of them are successful and some of them are failures. But in the end, you, you, you stand behind them and, they, and I feel like there is a thread. I get that question a lot when I do lectures. People are like, it looks like five different artists. It can be a little bit schizophrenic. And I think that's just my restlessness sometimes. Um, I see them more linked, but then I can also see how people would respond that they look different, um, you know, different bodies of work. I always like artists like, you know, someone like Richter. Richter has four painting styles. I always thought that was great that he could that he could actually be invested in four different ways to make a painting and have a pretty successful career at those four different painting styles. Um, I think he's pretty lucky and an anomaly, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dimitri, you had another question. I don't know, you're getting extra airtime. Go ahead. Um, it's on, it almost con contradicts to what Paul is saying. Um, let's say, well, I, I also have um, um, 
several styles, and uh, it seems like uh, the message here is, okay, one style for one gallery, maybe another style for a different gallery, or maybe for two, a separate website even. Um, so I don't know if it's a question, but uh, it's all puzzling. I, I, don't, I don't know if it's style as much as it is context. I, whenever I taught, I always, I, I told my students there's three C's to arts. There's context, composition, context, composition, and content. Those are the three. So your content, your content's always going to be there. Your context is going to be there. That's where you put your art, and your composition is going to be there. So the art you show in one gallery can be different than the art you show in someone's group show in their garage or or in a museum. It doesn't, I don't necessarily think it has to be the same. Um, you should check out Jeremy Diller's work. He, he's an awesome artist. And like he did a big show at the MCA about Iraq. And then for the Olympics, he did an inflatable Stonehenge. You know, they couldn't be further apart. But the context of both of those pieces was like really smart. Um, so I think you can have different styles, but I think the, the context of the work dictates it too. Some, some people want you to make the same piece over and over, but I think that the interesting people want you to mix it up too. You know, the, the people that want to show your work, they like, they like to see some range. I think that's frequently challenging or difficult to make, to show that kind of range when you're starting out. Because I think people want to be able to pigeonhole you. I, so, Jason, I'm curious. <clears throat> do you feel that that's a good initial strategy, or it's an okay strategy once you've gotten some acknowledgement? Um, you know, I don't know if there's a right answer to that. You know, um, I remember going to this guy's studio in graduate school, this drunk guy I met. His name was John Flipchuck. And every day, John Putnam made 50 sculptures out of popsicle sticks. He gave them away. They looked like garbage. And, you know, I guess after a while, they became his voice and his, his kind of work. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I think that you can get away with anything nowadays. I don't think you have to make the same thing over and over to get a gallery. I think if you're an interesting artist, because people are going to want to work with you. You know, I think that's the answer. I think that's a slightly old model that I've got to make 15 paintings that are watercolors or something. You know, I, I see galleries taking on artists that are interesting now, not necessarily making cookie cutter art. You know, it, 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 it can be true if you want to work with somebody and that's their program. It's more conservative. It's more traditional, maybe. But um, I, I just don't know the right answer to that question. I don't think there is a formula, you know. Cool. All right, let's move on to maybe this should be the last question. Lynn, go ahead. Hi, Jason. Thanks for speaking with us. Um, I actually had a follow-up question when you were talking about San Francisco and L.A. Um, you mentioned that Silicon Valley wasn't interested in art, and I was just wondering, well, are, are the people who have made money in Silicon Valley actually not interested in art, or do they just buy it from New York or from somewhere else? You know, um, that's a difficult question. I don't think there's a lot of curators. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of collectors in the Silicon Valley. Um, if they are, I know there's some big ones in Napa. There's some big ones in San Francisco. I don't know how many collectors that made a lot of money from the from 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 the Silicon Valley or from the you know the dot com boom or actually buying art. I don't know about that. Um, you don't know the like, that comes to mind for me. Yeah, it's kinda of like the myth of Hollywood. A lot of Hollywood doesn't buy a lot of art. A lot of movie stars don't buy art. It's like, you know, there are some like Steve Martin and big actors that do buy art, but uh the reason why I said that the Bay Area isn't that supportive is uh there isn't a there isn't a tradition like New York or Los Angeles where the museums um, are supported like they are in New York and Los Angeles. Uh, the the money is put into different types of infrastructure in the Bay Area. It's it's really about healthy living and architecture and food and and technology. 
And I, I just don't feel like there's a, an emphasis in art in, in the in the history of the Bay Area like there are in those other cities. Um, that's not to say that there's people that made a lot of money in Silicon Valley that aren't buying art, but I, I haven't met that many. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Let's wrap this up. <clears throat> Excuse me. Jason, I think this has been awesome. I think it's been, you know, you're really honest and you've really shared a lot of stuff. Unfortunately, you don't agree with me on everything. Um, <laughs> like the Niners are going to win tonight? <laughs> the Niners are ahead 10 to nothing at the moment, damn it. Oh, shit. You're not supposed to tell me that. I'm recording it. Okay. Uh oh. And, oh, good. Good. Um, <laughs> you're a Bears fan. I know. My my apologies, um, but I think this has been really great. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Let me unmute this so everybody else can literally um, okay. Okay. my appreciation. Jason, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 All right, everybody, have a great Thanksgiving, and I'll see you next week. Thank